Is the end near? Do believers fail to see the connection between the second coming of Christ and the global mission of the church? The sign of the end times that Jesus presented in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel being proclaimed everywhere, ought to produce joy about what will happen as we get closer to the end of the age. Believers believe in Jesus' second coming, however, still have a long wait ahead of them. They anticipate the return of their Savior and know that they must get ready for that day. Let's look into the last rapture sign closely. For as long as the church has existed, there have been believers who anticipated the impending arrival of the end times. A few of the more daring ones have even established firm deadlines. It wasn't so long ago that radio evangelist Harold Camping made headlines by predicting the end of the world in May 2011. In light of the fact that this did not occur, Camping moved the date of his prophecy to October. As an aside, he had predicted that the end of the world would occur in 1994. In 1988, retired NASA engineer Edgar Wisenant wrote a bestseller claiming that September of that year will see the rapture of believers. Pat Robertson, a former presidential candidate, said it would happen in 1982. According to the Jehovah's Witnesses' most recent predictions, the end of the time as we know it occurred in 1975. The founder of the Global Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, claimed the end of the world would occur in 1972. These forecasts were completely off. Practically anyone predicting an exact date seems to consider Matthew 24, 14. Wars, growing depravity, and natural disasters are common focal points for those who speculate on when the end of the world will occur. Extreme weather events, the spread of deadly pathogens, widespread hunger and drought, and rising tensions between countries are all discussed. Bible Prophecy Matthew 24 and the Last Days Jesus' statement that the final sign of the end times is the proclamation of the gospel to all people is hardly ever cited. The vision that Matthew 24, 14 refers to has been called into question. Does that entail spreading the gospel to every person and place on the planet? In Matthew 24, 14, the world translated as people is actually plural and might also be interpreted as peoples. In this context, Matthew 24, 14 may refer to the presence of a Christian witness among all peoples and cultures. Whatever the goal may be, it may be said that significant strides have been made toward achieving it. More people than ever before are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ preached. But there is much more work to be done. There is no active church planting movements among at least 5,000 different people. Oftentimes, the signs of the end of the world that people focus on are actually just the result of their own anxiety. Instead, the universal proclamation of the gospel Jesus promised in Matthew 24, 14 should cause people to have a changed attitude. As we draw closer to the end of the days, we can take comfort in the fact that everyone will finally be able to hear the good news for what it is. Assuming the truth of Matthew 24, 14, sharing the gospel with everyone you meet is a must. As such, it must be completed. Will we cooperate in an obedient way to make it happen? Is there any meaning to Matthew 24, 14? The idea of applying biblical predictions to the here and now is a deeply held one among many Christians. Christians all throughout the world are enthusiastically involved in missions to the unreached. Is it possible that these two factions of believers are on parallel but irreconcilable paths? Former U.S. Center for World Mission Director Ralph Winter remarked, For some reason, Christians frequently find no link between talk of prophecy and future events and discussion of missions. More emphatically, Arthur Glasser said it after the 1966 Congress on the Church's Global Mission in Wheaton, Illinois. Books galore are being produced on being delivered from the tribulation, but nothing important on the relation between Christ's return and the church's worldwide mission. Do you need further evidence that these two men are complaining? The pages of the late great planet Earth will tell you everything you need to know. Despite the book's widespread success, author Hal Lindsey avoided discussing missions or the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. Is there a link between the contemporary push to evangelize and plant churches among all peoples and the return of Christ? The answer is probably yes. Although there is little written on the connections between the end times and the church's efforts to fulfill the Great Commission, this does not mean that we are out on a limb by making the connection. There is a strong and scriptural link between the end of the world and the spread of the gospel over the globe. Swiss Lutheran theologian Cullman has even made the claim that the proclamation of the gospel as an eschatological sign is not a peripheral phenomenon because of how strong the links are. Jesus' Discourse on the Mount of Olives, also known as the Olivet Discourse, is one of the most eloquent examples of a biblical link between global evangelism and eschatological. The group following Jesus sought more concrete predictions. When the disciples came to Jesus, they questioned him, Teacher, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of an age? At the beginning of his response, Jesus warns of impending apostasy, false prophets, famines, wars and earthquakes, as well as the religious and international conditions that would reign. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testament to all nations. Jesus says, shifting gears from the terrible news to the good. There has been some discussion over what Jesus meant by the words. What does it mean that this was preached? Is there a universal 
unit of measurement for globally? Just what is meant by the phrase, as a witness to all nations? How will we know when this prophecy answering every question that could be raised about Matthew 24:14 is outside the scope? But let's look at the major theories about when things will happen and who will bring about the prophecy's fulfillment. The purpose of this video is to provide a response to the following question, does Matthew 24, 14 pertain to the contemporary mission of the church? Scholars' responses to this question, however, have been extremely diverse. Even so, we can classify them into one of three broad classes. People who think Jesus was talking about evangelism in the first century before AD 70 are called first century literalists. Dispensationalist-influenced premillennialism holds that Jesus prophesied a brief window of opportunity for the evangelism of the entire globe after the church has been raptured. First, let's analyze these three potential outcomes. Implications for missionary theology will be discussed when each view is presented. Before we get into the meat of the discussion, there's one more thing to cover. The authenticity of Jesus' claims in Matthew 24:14 is hotly debated amongst biblical scholars. Let us assume without further investigation that Donald Guthrie, a professor at a Bible college, in London is correct in his assessment. Unless there is evidence to the contrary, as Guthrie put it, it is reasonable to conclude for the authenticity of these sayings. Now that we've established our working assumptions regarding the passage's reliability, we may examine its meaning. Is it possible that Jesus meant for Matthew 24, 14 to speak to something that will happen in the very near future? Floyd Filson did not advocate for a particular chronology in his works based on Matthew 24, 14, yet he made an insightful comment about what the verse might be saying. It was pointed out that such a global mission, which appears long-lasting to us, is here, as in Matthew 28, 19, regarding as the task of a generation. There are two possible schools of thought for those who believe Jesus meant a period of one generation or less. Christians in the first century AD believed that Matthew 24, 14 had been fulfilled in the years after Pentecost and preceding Jerusalem's fall to Titus in 70 AD. This interpretation, which sees a close connection between Matthew 24, 14 and Matthew 28, 19 to 20, deserves more thought. The conviction that the end of the world will come during a single human lifetime. This theory, which is consistent with a dispensational interpretation of Scripture, holds that the events of Matthew 24, 14 will take place during the brief tribulation era that will follow the rapture of the church. It comes as no surprise that many who hold this interpretation wrap Matthew 24, 14 in the dramatic symbolism found in the book of Revelation. Several explanations for Matthew 24, 14 focus on various words or phrases Jesus may have used. The last sentence of Matthew 24, 14, and then the end will come, is given special emphasis by futurists and premillenarians who believe that the universal proclamation occurs after the rapture of the church. How relevant is Matthew 24, 14 to our lives now? The mission of the church today and this statement from the tribulation time are not universally agreed upon by those who subscribe to a post-rapture interpretation of Matthew 24, 14. Some people interpret this term to mean that the task of evangelizing the globe will be completed once the church is destroyed. They see Matthew 24:14 as a call to order before the end of the world so that the ends of the earth in Matthew 28:19 to 20 will have been reached. In the eyes of these individuals, Jesus was foretelling a gospel preaching endeavor that is completely unique from the work being done by the church today putting an end to the work the church has begun. To demonstrate this perspective on getting the task done, I'll use two quotations from the next section. The inclusion of finished in both quotes suggests that the authors believe the message of Matthew 24, 14 will be proclaimed again after the rapture, in addition to the current global missionary outreach activities. After the church is raptured before the Great Tribulation, many believe that the world will be evangelized. The final stage of the witness may not occur until the church is raptured and this second heavenly messenger announces the everlasting gospel. Naturally, such a position has a few confined consequences for a theology of missions. This concept makes it abundantly evident that the spread of the gospel is not bound by the restrictions that Christians of the present day may hold. But, unlike other readings of Matthew 24, 14, a post-rapture reading of the verse does not inject urgency into a theology of missions. It's something really different and novel. It is believed by some that Jesus predicted the spread of the gospel during the tribulation. One early dispensationalist, Arno Gabalin, argued that the church's current efforts at global evangelization have nothing to do with Jesus' response to his disciples in Matthew 24, 14. Absolutely, any effort to spread the gospel over the world is a beautiful and glorious thing. There is no way for the church as we know it to be relevant during the tribulation period if Jesus was preaching about that time. Who then will make this announcement or give this sermon? Three proposed agents have been proposed. Two are mentioned by Homer Kent of Grace Theological Seminary. 
He claims Jesus prophesied that the gospel would go into all the globe during the tribulation through the efforts of the two witnesses and the sealed remnant of Israel. 1. Preachers who happen to be human. Some Christians believe that God will still use mortals to spread the word after the church is destroyed. Some Christians believe that following the rapture of the church, the tribulation saints will travel the globe proclaiming the gospel to those who have not yet to hear the good news. Nonetheless, there are many who argue that this preaching is being done by converted Jews, citing Revelation chapters 6 and 7. One advocate of the latter school of thought is Biblical Research Society founder David Cooper. In order to shed light on Matthew 24, 14, he says, According to this prophecy, the gospel will be preached to every nation in the brief time frame of the Great Tribulation. So who exactly is going to deliver all of those sermons? God has revealed his plan, and history shows that the Jews have always fulfilled God's plans. Some have interpreted the two witnesses who were killed in Revelation 11 as the ones who will make the worldwide proclamation predicted in Matthew 24, 14. Some have speculated that the two witnesses in Revelation are Moses and Elijah, Old Testament figures who returned to earth to preach for 1260 days. W. E. Blackstone, a Methodist dispensationalist, is only one example of an author who seems eager to explore every possible angle. Blackstone included every conceivable preaching proclaiming agent in his exegesis of Matthew 24:14, bringing up a veritable procession of actors. Blackstone anticipated the following progression from Jesus' remarks. First, he believed that Matthew 24:14 was being fulfilled right now through the church. Finally, after the rapture, he thought tribulation saints would continue preaching until converted Israel finally took up the mantle. To be a messenger from God, Blackstone concluded. That's all for the video today. We will be right back. Until then, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.